having another beautiful winter storm. I just love it. So I'm going to go out and play in a little while. But we are going to read some more of Valley of the Dolls. It is getting so, so steamy. Wow. And we are pretty much halfway through. And here is my shout out. It's my toothbrush. I like these Colgate 360s. I hope they never discontinue them. Sometimes I find a toothbrush I really love and then they stop making them. And I have to find another one that I like. But these ones really work for me. Colgate 360. And this is my product placement is my mascara. I buy this at the Dollar Tree because after about a month I throw it away because, you know, it, it turns into a Petri dish. And it's only a dollar, so it's no big deal. But now the Dollar Tree in my neighborhood is closing, and I don't know what's going to go in its place. Maybe a five below, if you ask me, I would deal with that. So, well, no more Dollar Tree, no more cheap crap from China. Life is good. Let's just get started now with Valley of the Dolls. It is getting so steamy. This book is just crazy good. We are up to page 248. And of 500 pages, and this chapter is called Jennifer, May 1947. Jennifer sat beside the pool in the shade. She read Anne's letter. She sounded happy enough. It was the first letter without a mention of Leon. Maybe she was finally over it. But how could she live in his apartment? Did she still hope he'd come walking in one day? After five months, imagine one word, not one word from him, just showed you could never tell what really went on inside a man's head. Take all those pictures of her with Tony. They look so happy, the perfect young Hollywood couple. The sun crept under the umbrella. She reached out and bent the framework down to shield herself. Sure, a girl who had got hives as she sat in the sun had to wind up in California. She glared angrily at the blazing orange ball. It was always there. It was the one thing in California you could count on. On occasion, there might be a slight fog in the morning, but inevitably the lemon disc would take, make an appearance timidly at first, then as if inflating itself, it would brighten and inhale the mist and clouds and emerge triumphant and alone in a china blue sky. She sighed every day here since her arrival in January it had been like the middle of July. How did those damn oranges grow if it never rained? It was May in New York. In the East, you appreciated good weather when it finally arrived. She thought about New York. The first balminess might be in the air. The heavy winter coats had been stored away, and people were sitting outside the cafeteria in Central Park. And you could walk in New York. You never appreciated the privilege of walking until you lived in California. You could even walk at night in New York. If you had nothing to do, you could walk down Fifth Avenue and look in the stores or go to a late movie or walk down Broadway and buy a hot dog. Here, if you walk down Beverly Drive at night, a prowl car would pick you up. Well, at least Anne had New York. According to her letter, she was going out a lot, but she never mentioned anyone special, probably still waiting for Leon. Well, at last, that was something tangible. But what was she waiting for? Another day to pass? There was a party for tonight. It didn't thrill her, but it was better than playing Jen with Tony. He couldn't even concentrate on that because Miriam kept hanging over him, telling him every card to play. If Miriam would only let him think for himself once in a while. She sipped her Coke. The ice had melted. Why did warm Coke taste like a laxative? <laughs> she was too lazy to go back in the house for a fresh one. She was too lazy to do anything, and the party, that, would be, that wouldn't be any fun. It was business. Tony was up for the lead in Dick Meeker's new picture, so she had to be pleasant and polite. Pleasant and polite. Miriam constantly drummed those words into her ears. Don't try and be big, be a big personality out here. Out here, you're nothing. Everyone is a big shot here, so you just be pleasant and polite. She did her best. She floated through parties like a grinning zombie. Zombie. She made no friends. Miriam was right. Beauty was a cheap commodity in Hollywood. 
there were millions of beautiful nobodies. The girls who hung out on sh at Schwab's were beautiful. The car hops were beautiful. Yet most of the big stars were not that spectacular beauty in beauty sense. Jane Wyman was pert looking. Barbara Stanwyck was smart, chic. So was Rosalind Russell. Joan Crawford was striking. Boy, this was a pistol. All these years thinking she had something special because her teeth were good, her nose was straight, and she had big boobs. Big boobs weren't even in style. Adrian and Ted Casablanca and all the other big designers had created the broad sh shoulder look. Big boobs only got in the way. It would be another nothing evening. There was no one, just Mr. Polar, the wife of a promising newcomer. Oh yes, she was on radio, some, some might say, but that didn't mean a thing out here. You had to be in pictures, and a wife didn't mean anything. In fact, a wife held the same social status as, as a screenwriter, necessary but anonymous. Even the starlets rated more attention at parties. Starlets were always available, ready for any kind of action. Starlets knew producers and often had hilarious inside stories to tell the big screen star who always yelled, Mother, when he reached the climax. The movie mogul who wanted his wife to watch. Sure, starlets could garner plenty of attention at parties, but a wife, a wife lived in limbo. Too respected to be approached, too unimportant to rare rate respect. At most parties, she would up at the bar, discussing old times with the hired bartenders who had hailed from New York, talking nostalgically about Sardis and Lindy's. It was easier than talking to the other displaced wives who cared only about the servant problem in tennis. She couldn't even go on shopping sprees like she had before she married. She had been allowed to buy one evening gown in the five months she had been here. You have more clothes than a department store, Miriam had snorted. Maybe she did, but she got tired of them. Didn't Miriam realize it was important to wear something new? But Miriam had only three dresses, and they, looked like, they all looked alike. Miriam went to parties in a five-year-old blue lace dress and white orthopedic shoes. Miriam gave her an allowance of $50 a week. She sent it all to her mother, and her mother kept writing that it wasn't enough. She had tried to talk to Tony about the money situation, but she hardly ever saw him. He was either recording, learning new songs, or rehearsing his radio show. And at dinner, there was always Miriam. At night, alone in the large bed, he was the old Tony, grasping for her greedily. But after it was over, she couldn't reach him. She had tried to explain that if she could be part of his life and career, she wouldn't be bored. But he didn't seem to understand. Miriam takes care of all of that. Talk to her. When she mentioned money, it was the same. Talk to Miriam. She'll give you all you need. And Miriam had all the answers. What do you need money for? I pay for all the food and the booze. You can charge the gas. Fifty dollars is plenty for pen money. It couldn't go on like this. How much longer could she just sit by the pool? She had read three books so far this week, and it was only Friday. The sun had crept under the umbrella again. She jumped up. She had to do something, go somewhere. Mamie Neely would be home. She had just finished her second picture, and the studio had promised her a month's vacation. She went into the house, changed into slacks. She was glad for Neely. Her picture had gotten raves, and Jennifer had seen a sneak preview of the new one. It was great. She hadn't seen much of Neely, though. They talked on the phone occasionally, but Neely had just changed her number again, and she didn't have the new one on. She had the new one unlisted, and she didn't have the new unlisted one. She drove the eight blocks. You just didn't walk in California, anyway. If Neely wasn't home, she'd go over to Schwab's. Maybe Sydney Skol Skolsky would be there, and they could sit and talk. Sydney loved Hollywood, but he also understood how she felt. Mal opened the door. He was in bathing trunks. He had filled out, he had filled out and the tan made him look almost healthy. He led Jennifer to the swimming pool. Want some lunch? I'm having a sandwich. Jennifer shook her head. She sat down in the shade. Their pool was identical to hers. Same kidney shape, same cabana area, same tennis court and prop bar. She looked off to the purplish hills. 
Did Mel sit around all day, too? Neely's at the studio, he explained, wardrobe fittings. I thought she had a month off. Sure, a month off before shooting. That means a month of wardrobe fittings, makeup tests, and publicity stills. But she could, should be home any minute. Hey, did you hear? Ted Casablanca's doing her clothes. She's really in the big leagues, Jennifer said. Ted won't design for anyone but the top stars. Mel lunched his, hunched his bony shoulders. Only in Hollywood could this happen. Women fainting because some fag design, da, da, deigns to dress them any place else. If you pay the money, you get the article. In New, York, in New York, does Saks worry if a customer will do justice to their creations? But out here, everything is a status symbol. Neely's dieting now. Is that a laugh? Well, why? Has she gained weight? She weighs 118. She's always weighed that. She's five feet five. That's a nice weight. But this Casablanca, he wants her to lose 15 pounds. Says her face will be more interesting and the clothes will look better. She takes little green pills, doesn't eat a thing. Neely suddenly arrived, her old breathless self. She was delighted to see Jennifer. Have you heard? She squealed. Ted Casablanca's doing my clothes. Oh, Jennifer, he's divine. I'm going to be beautiful for a change. He's making me some really glamorous things. Real understated. Jeez, when I remember that awful perfect purple taffeta, Tez says I should have the gammon look. The mischievous little girl, but chic. After all, I'm 18 now. It's about time. I hear you're dieting. Yeah. Mel, get me some skim milk. Want anything, Jen? A Coke? We only have club soda. I don't keep anything fattening around. Mel, make Jen, Jen a lemonade. How's that? Neely watched him leave. Then she turned back to Jennifer, her childish eyes wide with concern. Oh, Jen, I don't know what to do. He's, he's changed, so he just can't get with it. Everything he does, he bungles. I wouldn't say that. He's gotten you a lot of publicity. The story in Screen World is a great layout. Neely shook her head. The studio did that. They told him to butt out. He gets in the way all the time. They don't want him on the set. They say, I'm conscious. I'm self-conscious when he's around. And Ted Casablanca said he's the joke of the town. I wouldn't take that seriously. You know how bitchy fags can be. Fag. Neely's eyes blazed. Don't you dare call him that. Why, he's wonderful, that's all. He's only 30, and he's made $3 million, and he's not a fag. Really? Really? What do you think I've been doing today? Fitting costumes? That's what I told Mel. We've been doing it, Ted and I, in every position in his gorgeous air-conditioned studio. And let me tell you, he's no... She stopped suddenly. Mel was bringing in the tray with their drinks. I've lost five pounds already, Neely said as Mel handed her the milk. She took out a bottle and popped a speckled green capsule into her mouth. What an invention, she said. They're absolutely marvelous, Jen. Really kills your appetite. Only trouble is, they pet me up so much I can't sleep. Hey, Turner, good. how are you doing? Good to see you. Try second alls, Jennifer suggested. They really work. Gloriously, they're beautiful little red dolls that take your cares away and give you nine blissful hours of sleep a night. No kidding? I'll try them, Mel. Call Dr. Holt right away. Tell him to send me a hundred. A hundred, Jennifer's voice caught in her throat, Neely. They're, they aren't aspirin. You only take one a night. No doctor will give you more than 25. They won't, huh? Want to bet? Dr. Holt is the studio doctor. He'll give me anything I ask for. Mel, call him right now. Mel lumbered off to the phone. Just one a night, huh? Jennifer nodded. She saw no reason to tell Neely. She sometimes took as many, three, as, many as three. One would help Neely. Besides, she intended to cut down as soon as she straightened things out with Tony. Hi, lunatic friends. Good to see you. 
Mel had gone to telephone. Neely watched until he was out of sight. Then she pulled her chair closer. I got to get fitted for another diaphragm. Twice last month, Mel didn't pull out in time. That son of a bitch is trying to get me pregnant. I thought you wanted children. Not with him. I'm going to unload him. Neely. Look, he's a drag. Honest, Jennifer. He's changed completely. He has no incentive. I talked it over with the head and he agrees. Mel just gets in the way. He insisted I shouldn't lose weight, kept yelling I was fine just as I am. But now I'm losing weight. I'm getting a real star build up with some glamour. See, Mel is in a rut. He's small time and he won't get with it and change. But I gotta be careful, see? There's community property out here. Mel could claim half of everything. What will you do? It's all being worked out. She lowered her voice to a real whisper. The head is seeing to it that Mel gets a big offer in the East with one of the top publicity offices. I'll make him go. The head is going to fix it, have him caught, you know, with a girl, and I'll get the divorce. Neely, you can't. Well, what can I do? I handed at divorce last week, and you know what he did? He started crying like a baby. He said he couldn't live without me. Is that a drag? I need a man who tells me what to do and a guy I can lean on, not one who leans on me. And all I'd ever have to do is to get knocked up by him and then he'd never leave, not even for New York. How do you know he'll accept the job? I'll make him. I'll tell him that if he makes good, if the job works out, I'll come there and get in a Broadway show and have a baby and live in New York. Would you? Neely looked at her strangely. Leave California? All this? Are you crazy? I got it made here. After my next picture, I'll be a full-fledged star. But you could be a star in New York on Broadway. A star on Broadway? Big deal. That's chicken feed. When you're a star in pictures, you're a star all over the world. Do you know my picture is playing in London? Imagine. They know who I am in London. One movie, and I'm ten times better known than Helen Lawson will ever be. And when you're a star in pictures, you get treated like a star. Everything is done for you. I remember Helen had to ride the train to New Haven like the rest of us and dress in a drafty dressing room. Geez, our toilets at the studio are fancier than a star's dressing room in the theater. My dressing room is a bungalow as big as Helen's Park Avenue apartment. When you're a hot property, that's what I am. They do everything for you. I just mentioned to the head, that's what we call uh, C.H. Bean. He's such a wonderful little man. Sweet, and you can talk to him like a father. I never knew my father. But as I was saying, I just mentioned to him that I wanted to lose some weight. Jeez, know what, what he did? He had a steam room built into my bungalow and hired a personal masseuse and they pay for it. I have to go, I, when I have to go anywhere, like an opening, they send a car and a chauffeur for me and lend me furs and dresses. And if my next picture is as big as the first two, the head said he's going to give me a new contract at a big salary jump, maybe 2000 a week. That's really big money, Neely. Nah, the Johnson Harris office says I'm worth even more. In fact, they might step in and renegotiate maybe to 2500 a week. I could probably get it too. All I got to do is snap my fingers and I can have anything I want. The head says maybe after another year, I could dump this rented house and buy one in Beverly Hills. That's classier. Why not take it easy and save your money? Why? I'm not scared anymore. Know why? Because I've got talent. Jen, I never realized it back in East. I used to think everyone could sing and dance, but in my second picture, I found I could act too. Did you see when I cried? That was no glycerin. The director just talked to me about the part, the situation the girl was in, and I felt it. And then I really cried. Jennifer nodded. You made me cry, too. I saw the preview last week. Neely stretched her arms expansively. I love it here. This town was made for me. 
Mel returned, the pills will be here any minute. Dr. Holt said it was a very good idea. He sat down. Want to see a movie tonight, Neely? Can't have to be up at six tomorrow. Color test. He stared moodily at the swimming pool. I don't have to be up at any time. I'm getting stir crazy just sitting around. Jennifer thought about Mel as she drove home. She suddenly wondered how Tony felt about her. Was she a drag too? If Tony didn't get the picture, she was going to insist they go back to New York. He could do the radio show from there, but he would get the picture. She knew he would, and she'd be stuck here. Soon, Tony would start feeling about her like Neely felt about Mel, if he didn't already. There would be stars playing opposite him in pictures, the young starlets chasing after him. How long could she go on sitting like this? She was almost 27, and soon it would begin to show. She almost went through a traffic light at the, as the idea hit her. Why hadn't she thought of it before? A baby. She would have a baby. It would bring Tony closer to her, and she'd have something to occupy her thoughts, something to love. Oh, God, how she'd love it. They'd be so close. It would be a girl. It had to be. And she'd be a wonderful mother. She was exhilarated when she got home. It would, it would be her secret. She dressed, with gate care. she dressed with great care for the party. She would start her new project tonight. Now we are up to September 1947. She missed her first period in August. At first, she was too excited to say anything, but in September, when she missed the second time, she knew her waistband had expanded two inches. She went to a doctor who verified her hopes and congratulated her. Tony was in a close record recording session and she couldn't disturb him, but she had to tell someone she wanted to shout it at a policeman directing traffic. She wanted to go to Schwab's and yell it at everybody, but that wouldn't be right. Tony would want to give it a big press release. Neely, she would tell Neely. It was almost five. Neely would be through shooting, should be sh done shooting for the day. She drove to the studio, the gateman checked, and directed her through to Neely's imposing bungalow. Neely was getting a massage. Hey, come on in, she shouted. Your timing is perfect. I was going to phone you tonight. Guess what? It's all set. Mel leaves for t New York tomorrow. Is it still Ted? Of course. What do you think I am? Some kind of a bum? I'm a one-man woman, Ted and me. She stopped and shouted at the masseuse. Okay, that's enough scram. I want to talk to my girlfriend in private. When the woman had gone, she dropped the towel. Well, how do you like the new streamlined Neely? I got a 20-inch waist now, and I weigh 98 pounds. Does Ted like you this thin? Does he? She climbed into a robe. He even likes my little boobs. They shrunk some but he says big ones make him think of a cow and they look lousy in the broad-shouldered look. We're getting married as soon as this Mel business is settled and guess what? We're signing a prenuptial agreement. It was the head's idea. This way we'll both know we're marrying for love and not for each other's property. Jennifer managed to smile. Neely, guess what? I'm two months pregnant. Oh, jeez, Neely. Neely was instantly concerned. Well, there's a guy in Pasadena. He's supposed to be very good. The head sends everyone who gets knocked up to him. First, he tries shots, then if they don't work, the abortion is easy. He even gives anesthesia. Neely, you don't understand. I want this baby. I planned it. I'm happy about it. Oh, well, say, that's marvelous. You know, it's beginning to show already now that you mention it. You've lost your marvelous waistline. Who cares as long as I have a marvelous baby, Jennifer mimicked Neely's enunciation of the word. Neely laughed good-naturedly. After it's over, I'll lend you some of my green dolls to help you get your figure back. They sure work for you. Yeah, but the trouble is you got to keep taking them. The second I stop, I eat like a maniac. But the feeling is great, sets you on fire like you could dance for hours, and I bless you every night for those little red ones. They save my life. Oh, hey, have you ever tried a yellow one? They're called Nimutals. 
uh, if you take one of each, a red and a yellow, wow, you really sleep. I learned it by experiment. The red one puts you to sleep fast, but it wears off in six hours. The yellow one works slower, but it lasts longer. So I figured, why not try both? I only do it on weekends. Sometimes I sleep 12 hours. I'm not going to take anything now that I'm pregnant. I don't want to hurt the baby. Yeah, but if you don't sleep, you'll look bad, won't you? For the first time in my life, I'm not worried about my looks. I want a perfect baby. If I lie awake at night, I won't care. Neely grinned. You sound corny, but I guess I'll feel that way too after I marry Ted and negotiate my new contract. Then I'll get pregnant. But meanwhile, thank God for those little red, yellow, and green dolls. Jennifer hoped Tony had nothing planned for the evening. She wanted to go to that little restaurant in the valley without Miriam and tell him there. She saw the extra car in the driveway. It belonged to Delia, the part-time extra maid. Oh, damn, that meant something was on for the night. Miriam was waiting for her. Tony signed the contract today. Her homely face was glowing. They just seen the rushes of his color test. He got a five-year deal at Metro, and he starts on the picture two weeks from Monday. Dress real ladylike tonight. The director and his wife are coming for dinner, and the musical conductor and a few others are dropping by later. Jennifer dressed carefully. All right, she'd break it at dinner publicly. As she struggled with the zipper of her dress, she realized she couldn't wait much longer. Tony would notice it soon anyway. She took a martini before dinner. Miriam stared at her in amazement. Jennifer sparkled and made small talk with the wife of the director. Past the canapes was the perfect Hollywood wife. She waited until the wine was served at dinner. They stood up slowly, holding her glass in the air, carefully avoiding Miriam's hostile stare. She said, I want to make a toast to me. Then she started to giggle. I mean, to what's in me. Tony and I are going to have a baby. Everyone cheered, glasses clinked. Tony leapt out of his chair and hugged her, but Jennifer had not missed Miriam's audible gasp and stricken look. When the excitement died down, her eyes met Miriam's. This time, the pudgy face held only a pleasant smile. When the last gas had disappeared, Miriam turned to Jennifer. She was still smiling. Run upstairs, little mother, she said. You need all the rest you can get. There's a few details on the picture I want to discuss with Tony. Then I'll send the new daddy right up. The moment Jennifer had gone, she whirled on him. I thought I told you to use something. We did, Tony grinned sheepishly. I guess it was an accident. What do you mean, accident? Miriam hissed. Those rubbers are made strong. I buy you the best. They don't break. Oh, we stopped using them a few months ago. Jen told me I didn't have to. She said she was using a diaphragm. I told you never, ever let any girl talk you into that. You could get a disease. From Jen? He laughed. Besides, it feels better without one. A baby will tie you down. Nah, we got enough money, haven't we? And with the picture and all, and I want to have a kid, it'll be fun. From the corner of her eye, Miriam saw Jennifer coming down the stairs. She said, if you have a baby, you'll have to be home more. Jennifer had stopped on the stairs and was listening. Tony, his back was to the door, couldn't see her. Okay, so I'll be home more, he shrugged. And give up that red-headed singer? He looked scared. Who told you? Look, there's something I don't, there's nothing I don't know. But don't worry, I won't tell Jennifer. Tell Jennifer what? She walked into the room. Miriam pretended surprised. Tony looked frightened. It's nothing, Jenny, said Miriam and her crazy ideas, just because I clown around with Betsy. You know, she's the redhead on my radio show in the, single, in the singing group. We clown around, that's all. So I'm clowning around, Miriam snapped. Three afternoons a week, he bangs her in the studio dressing room. He may not have been using the rubbers on you, Jennifer, but I buy him a box every week and he keeps running out. Now look what you've done, Tony whined it Jen, uh, as Jennifer tore out of the room. Look, make her get rid of that kid. You listen to me, Tony. It's no good for your career. There's plenty of doctors who can do it. I want it, he said stubbornly. Tony, she's, she was wheedling him now. Think of your screen image. A young, handsome, leading man. 
the studi studio is going to say you're the only 24. A kid won't hurt the image. A kid would hurt the image. Nuts, Sinatra has kids, so does Crosby. They're not going to make it away, take it away from us. He ran up the stairs after Jennifer. She stretched across the bed, sobbing when he entered the room. Honey, he sat down and began, began to rub her neck. Don't mind that, what Miriam said. We'll have our baby. Not mine, she sat up with her face streaked with mascara. Not mine. Let her go on running our lives, even to buying you condoms. And all this time, while I've been sitting in this house, being bored to death and getting older each month, you've been having a ball with some singer while I just sit watching Miriam get fatter and bossier every day. Why can I do this? What can I do? He wailed. You can tell her to get out, that I'll run the house from now on. I couldn't do that to Miriam. Where would she go? Any place, just away from us. I don't care if you give her half of everything you make, but just let us live our lives just once. Let be husband and wife, not two children living with Miriam. But who would take care of everything? Who would write my checks and read my contracts? Oh, Tony, other people get business managers. You could too. But why should I get a stranger who would cheat me? My own sister just does better than anyone, and she's always looking out for my best interests. But I can't live with her. Suddenly, he tensed. Are you asking me to throw my sister out? Tony, she pleaded. What kind of life have we got? We don't entertain unless it's business because Miriam says it's a waste of money to give parties. And now Miriam's talking about buying this awful house. She never asked me if I liked it. Although God only knows what we need the house for anyway. We could do as well in a two-bedroom apartment the way we live. We have no life. <laughs> I have to rehearse three days a week, he yelled. I have to do my show. I have to listen to new songs and learn them, play benefits, pose for publicity pictures. What do you want me to do? Sit around and entertain you? You knew what my life was when you married me. Miriam doesn't go all out. Go out at all. She doesn't go to half the places we go. We went to three benefits last month without her. What do you hear her complain? No, but I heard her on the phone for hours trying to get an extra ticket. We went without her because the studio only sent two tickets. I'm surprised she doesn't sleep with us. Before you came along, she devoted her whole life to me. She raised me. She never complains. She's unselfish, kind, good. And you want me to throw her out? It's either me or Miriam, Tony. For a moment, they both stared without speaking. Then he broke into a boyish smile. You don't mean that, honey. You'll have the baby. Look, I stood up to her on that, didn't I? Now let's go to sleep, he began to undress. In the silent dark darkness, he reached out in bed to embrace her. We haven't settled anything, she said grimly. What's there to settle? Miriam. Miriam stays, and so do you. He ripped off her nightgown. His mouth sought her breast. She tried to push him away. No, I want them. Soon there will be milk in them. Mm. Will you let me suck them too? She began to sob quietly. He looked up. Come on, let's do it. What are you crying for? She sobbed more violently. Don't tell me you're upset because I gave Betsy a little bang once in a while. She jumped out of bed. Oh, God, what kind of man was he? He sat up and put on the light. He looked bewildered. I, I don't love Betsy. She sank into a chair and hugged her nakedness, shivering. Then why do you do it? She sobbed. He struggled. He shrugged. It was just there, I guess. But I've always been here. I couldn't come dashing back to you during rehearsals, and she's always right there. But look, it doesn't mean anything. I promise I won't do it with Betsy anymore. Hell, I'll get Miriam to fire her tomorrow. How's that? Now come on, get in bed. It's not just Betsy, Tony, it's you. I don't understand you. How do you think? How do you feel? I want you right now. That's how I feel. Come on, honey. Because she didn't know what else to do, she got into bed and even submitted to his embraces. He satisfied himself, then turned on his side and fell instantly into a deep sleep. Jennifer got up and took three of the red pills, but it was getting light when she finally fell asleep. The following morning after Miriam and Tony had gone to rehearsal, she put in a call to Henry Bellamy. She told him the story. Looks like you better run for your life, Henry said. Somehow she'll make you lose the baby, if only by aggravation. Hi, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> meow, meow. 
What do I do? Depends how you feel about this joker. I don't know anymore. Sometimes I feel sorry for him because Miriam has brainwashed him. Other times, like last night, I feel only disgust, but there's a streak of sweetness in Tony. He's not bad, but the funny part, there isn't anything evil in him. He's just never grown up. It's Miriam's fault. She made him think the world is his oysters, that he can do anything he pleases just as long as he keeps singing. I think we could find a life together if I could get him to break with her, but I can't get, him, get, get it through to him. You're young, Jennifer. My advice is to get out while, you're getting, while the getting's good. I'm not as young as you think, Henry. I lied to you about my age. So what? You've still got a whole life ahead, but you have no life there. The way I see it, if you stick out there and do manage to have the baby, Miriam will just take it over, too. No. Then come to New York. See if Tony's man enough to come after you. I'll try and convince him I can run his business affairs as well as Miriam. We'll pension the old dame off, and you can turn him into a real man. If he doesn't go for it, then you've lost nothing. You're right, Henry. It's a cinch. I can't go on like this. I'll reserve a suite for you at the Pierre. Leave a note that you've been called to New York to audition for a show. Be sure and leave most of your clothes so Miriam can't say it's desertion. But Tony and Miriam know I can't take a show if I'm pregnant. Of course they do, but this is just the technicality. And be sure and write an identical note to someone else. Write, write it to Anne so you'll have proof if you need it. And send it to me. Send me a wire accepting the offer to come east. Jennifer followed the advice to the letter, and to her delight, Tony took a plane and followed her to New York. He placed the living room, he paced in the living room of her suite. He cried, he pleaded, he swore, he loved her, that he would do anything she wanted, anything except get rid of Miriam. But that's the only thing I'm asking, she insisted. Tony was adamant. She handles my money and runs my career. I don't trust anyone but Miriam. What about me? Don't you trust me? Don't push me, Jen. You're the best lay I've ever had, but lay? Is that what I am? What do you want it to be? Jesus, Miriam's right. You want to own me, to dry me out. I give what I have to singing, and what do you give me? My cock. And that should be enough? <laughs> Tony returned to California. Henry drew up a temporary separation agreement. Jennifer would receive 500 a week until the baby was born. Then she would receive 1000 a week plus, plus expenses and child support. The coming of the baby was to remain secret until her pregnancy was obvious. She would divorce Tony after the baby was born. Her separation from Tony made the front pages. For the, very, for the first week, she holed up at the Pierre and with the help of the red pills slept most of the time. Finally, Anne became concerned and insisted she move in with her. She forced Jennifer to go to the theater, and she met her for lunch almost every day, but Jennifer remained despondent. Her only release came at night with the Red Dolls. October 1947. Jennifer was well into her third month of pregnancy when Miriam arrived. She called from the airport. It was urgent that she see Jennifer right away. Jennifer's spirit soared. Miriam didn't frighten her now. Maybe Miriam was frightened. She had sounded desperate. Tony was probably moping, probably wasn't singing as well. So she was coming to beg for a reconciliation. Well, it would be on her terms. Miriam had to, had to leave, and Tony would have to come to her to apologize. She hadn't forgiven him, but she still clung to the hope that away from Miriam, Tony would re emerge as a person and the baby that had to change things. She wanted her little girl to have a father, not to grow up as she had in a house full of women. Tony would mature. He was still young. When she admitted Miriam to the apartment, she was conscious that she was looking her very best and that the apartment looked clean and neat. She was mistress of the situation. She even managed to smile. Sit down, Miriam. Would you like some coffee? The woman eased her bulk into a chair and sat tensely erect. Her eyes shot to Jennifer's waistline. No coffee. Let's cut the social crap and get to the cases. Jennifer held on to her smile. What does the case happen to be? Miriam's eyes narrowed. Is it really Tony's baby? Wait till you see it, Jennifer snapped. 
I'm sure it will be the image of him. Miriam got up and began to pace. Then she turned to Jennifer and said, how much do you want to get rid of it? Jennifer's stare was icy. Look, if it's money you want, I'll give it to you, Miriam said. I'll give you a big settlement in writing, and you can also have a thousand a week without the baby. Just get rid of it. Jennifer felt confused. Does Tony know about this? Is this what he wants? No. Tony don't know I'm here. I told him I was going to Chicago to see his radio sponsor and make a better deal. I'm here on my own to plead with you before you get in your fourth month and it's too late to get rid of it. Jennifer, what, Jennifer's voice was low and tense. You know, Miriam, I never really hated you until this moment. I always thought you were selfish, but at least it was for Tony. Now I know better. You're evil. And you're the all-American mother, Miriam snorted. You're just dying to walk in the park pushing a baby buggy, I suppose. I want this baby, Jennifer said earnestly. Miriam, all my life, I've never had anyone who really cared about me. My mother and grandmother just felt I was a drain. All I ever heard was how much I ate, how much it cost to buy my shoes, how I outgrew everything too fast. It got so I was frightened when my shoes got too small. I knew there'd be a scene. Then, when I was older, it was how much money I could bring in. Give me, give me, give me. So I married the prince. Maybe it wasn't a wild love match, but I figured I could support my mother and Gran, and I was going to try and be a good wife. But he didn't care about me. He was using me, too. I love Tony. All I ever asked was a chance to be a wife. But you never gave me a break. You stepped on me and put me down. But I'll have my baby now. She'll love me and belong to me, and I'll work for her. I'll work hard. I'm saving my money now. I don't even buy clothes. After the baby is born, I'll model, I'll save, and she'll have everything. For a moment, Marion stood silently and stared at her plump fingers. Then she said, Jennifer, maybe I misjudged you. If so, I'm sorry, she sighed heavily. All right, come back to Tony. I'll let you run the house. We'll try and get along. I'll do everything I can. Only you got to get rid of that baby. Marion, please leave. I don't want to insult you. I'll have my baby, and I'll get Tony back, too. Once he knows his child is born, he'll want to see it. He'll want us both, me and the child. You'll see. Jennifer, Mary's, Miriam's voice was almost kind. Listen to me, and listen good. You love Tony, and you were the love of his life, right? So he made one childish stab at getting you back. That's all. He's been out with a different girl every night since then. He's forgotten all about you in just three weeks. Please go, Miriam, Jennifer said tearfully. You've hurt me enough. Why keep at it? I'm trying to help you now, the woman pleaded. If I didn't have some feeling for you, I'd let you go ahead with it. But have we got to, what have we got to lose? Financially, the deal is made, and alimony is deductible, so I'm talking for you now. I tried to get you to unload the baby every way I could think of and still protect Tony. But you're stubborn, she began pacing again. Look, why do you think I told you about Tony and them girls? To hurt you? No, to save you from more hurt because never really learn to feel until you hold a baby in your arms. It becomes a part of you. It's a love you never dreamed you could feel and if anything goes wrong, with the baby, it hurts more than any guy can ever hurt. Jennifer, hasn't it ever hurt you that Tony is well? Childish? Jennifer looked at her strangely. There was something in Miriam's voice she had never heard before. Tony may be childish, she admitted, but perhaps you're to blame, Miriam. Jennifer, Tony is a child, mentally and emotionally, only because you overprotected him. No. That's why I protect him, and that's why I don't want you to have his child for your sake as well as his. I don't understand. Miriam sat beside her. Jennifer, listen to me. When he was a baby, he had convulsions. Something was born wrong inside his brain. The doctors at the hospital explained it to me, but I was too young to understand it at first. I couldn't believe anything was that wrong. 
they warned me he would never be normal, but he was just a year old and so beautiful. I refused to understand. But when he was seven, hey, how are you? Good to see you. But when he was seven and couldn't get past first grade work, I began to understand. I was older then and I had all kinds of tests made on him. This time I got the full picture. Haven't you noticed, Jen, Tony can barely read comic books. He can't add past 50, but he has no idea of his inadequacy. Hey, good to see you. Uh, I've kept it from him, but he has no idea of his inadequacy. I kept it from him by managing him, letting him think he doesn't know all these things because I handled them for him. That's why I keep telling him his only duty in life is to sing. But you said he had a convulsion when he was little. That probably did it. There's no reason why our baby shouldn't be all right, Jennifer argued. That kind of condition he has passed on. The doctors don't really know what causes it, but there's a good chance that Tony will be completely insane by the time he's 50, and his child will be born with the same condition. If it's lucky, it might have the mentality of a 12-year-old, but it could have even less, she paused, remembering. Jennifer, you don't know what it's like. When I found out about Tony, I got religion. I used to pray. I went to church, any church, and I dragged Tony along. I got him into a choir. That's when I found out he had a voice. I knew then that it was his only chance. Every, time, every dime I made, I put into lessons. She sighed. But that was a long time ago. This is now. That baby inside you probably won't inherit Tony's voice, but it will inherit his sickness. What about you, Jennifer asked. Will you go insane? Miriam shook her head. We had different fathers. Tony doesn't know that either. Please, Jennifer, for your own sake, get rid of the baby. How do I know you're telling the truth? I have the medical reports with me. She fumbled in her bag and took out a bulky envelope. I didn't figure you'd believe me. Why should you? I've never been especially nice to you. She handed over the envelope. Take these to, the neuro to any neurologist. But do me a favor, Jennifer. Please don't blab this around town. It would finish Tony's career, and that would finish Tony. I know he'll probably ride up in a mental institution someday, but if this got out, it would send him there now. That's why I save. You thought I was cheap, but I'm building an annuity for him. I stash every cent I can into it. I don't want him landing in some terrible charity place after I'm gone. I want him to have enough to keep him at a fancy joint for the rest of his days. But meanwhile, maybe he's got 15 good years, I hope, anyway. Jennifer handed back the envelope. I believe you, Miriam. No one could invent such a terrible story. Miriam had tears in her eyes. Jennifer, I really wish you well. You, you're welcome to come back to Tony, but you deserve a better life. And please, keep it a secret for him. You'll find someone else. Please, be kind to Tony. Get rid of his baby and forget him. Jennifer sat and stared in his face for several hours after Miriam had gone. She took the three. She took three red pills, and went to sleep. She never gave Anne or Henry any reason for the sudden decision. She found the doctor by herself, a nice antiseptic-looking man in New Jersey. There was a clean operating table and an efficient nurse. It cost a cost a thousand dollars. The nurse jabbed her in the arm with the needle, sodium pentothal, it was called, and it was a greater sensation than the second ounce. When she woke, it was over. Two weeks later, it was as if it had never happened. Her waistline returned to normal, and she flew to Mexico for the divorce. On the return, she entered into the excitement of a new fall openings and went on a uh, shopping spree for all new clothes. Dresses were getting longer, and everyone was fascinated with an 8-inch screen called television. You couldn't see much except the waist wrestling matches, ball games, and roller derbies on it. But everyone went around saying it would kill radio. Jennifer registered with the Longworth Agency again and began modeling. Soon Anne's closets were bulging once more with Jennifer's discards. The phone was always ringing and Jennifer was firmly entrenched in her new social life, dragging Anne along. Jennifer saw several men, but she favored Claude Chardot. He was a French film producer, Gaelic, charming, and an amorous. Anne didn't like him, but Jennifer plunged into a violent romance. There were three-hour luncheons, finger-kissing, dancing at the Regis, at the St. Regis, 
He spoke little English, and Anne was amazed at Jennifer's fluent French. On Christmas Eve, Jennifer and Anne trimmed a small tree. Claude had a few of his friends coming by. He leaves in 10 days, Jennifer said wistfully. Do you really care for him? I mean, really? Anne asked. Jennifer wrinkled her nose. Well, he's different. What do you think of him? Now be honest. I can't say half the time I don't understand him and the other half you two are jabbering away in French while I sit trying to understand his buddy's broken English. But I did manage to decipher from his pal Francois that your Claude has a wife stashed away. Naturally, probably a mistress too, Jennifer said easily. Whenever I get stuck on a man, you can be sure he's some kind of a louse. He wants me to come to Paris. You're not thinking of going. Jennifer shrugged. He wants to star me in pictures over there, say I'd be a smash, looking so American and speaking French. But you've always said you couldn't act. He wants me to do sex pictures. Artistic, but semi-nude. What? It's accepted over there, Anne. A lot of big stars do it. It means nothing. Oh, and I don't mean dirty pictures. I mean movies with a real plot. Only when you take a bath in a scene, they photograph it. But why should you? Why shouldn't I? What have I got going on for me here? I was the last season sensation. Soon I'll be 28, and I have two bad marriages behind me. I won't meet any real guy here. I've got a reputation now, mar married to a prince and then to a movie star. Men feel I'm too rich for their blood. Maybe Paris is the answer. I know Claude is a phony. He's been giving me this whole romance buildup just to get me to sign with him. He expects to make money with me, but so what? What have I got to lose? Hi, Fox TV. Good to see you. House Fox. Okay. But you've only been in New York such a short time. Why not give it a chance? I'm too well known. Nothing new is going to happen to me. Oh, I could get into another show, but it wouldn't be a good part. And then what? I'm not that great as a model. I have enough money from my alimony, but I'm sick of Morocco and the stork and the same stale faces. Hi. What about you? Are you still carrying on the love affair of the ages with New York? Anne shook her head. No, it kind of fell flat after Leon left. I read in the Times that his book comes out next month. He's probably working on his next one. Have you gone to bed with anyone since? No, I couldn't. I know it's foolish, but I still love Leon. Now we are up to the next chapter. It's titled Anne. January 1948. There was a three-hour luncheon at 21 on the day of Claude's departure. When Anne arrived, the party was well on its way. There was a large tin of Iranian caviar and the inevitable ice bucket of champagne. Jennifer looked radiant, played hostess to Claude, his friend Francois, and another man Anne had never met. I'm Kevin Gilmore, the stranger said. Jennifer grinned. Now, Anne, you must have heard of Kevin Gilmore. He owns Gillian Cosmetics. Of course, your products are excellent, she helped herself to some caviar. Are you going to Paris too, he asked. No, it's Jennifer who's going to be the new French sensation. She will take the town by storm, Claude said in his thick accent. But please, Anne, I depend on you to see she gets on the boat. She must be there by the end of the month, Jennifer laughed merrily and snuggled her nose, snuggled close to Claude. I'll be there as soon as I get my passport and tidy up a few things. Isn't it exciting, Anne, said to Kevin, trying to hide her lack of enthusiasm. I suppose so. Are those your teeth? What? Yours or Cap's? Anne smiled. His directness was disarming. They're my own. Why? And your hair? She felt the color come to her face. It's natural, she said quietly. I know that. I know enough about coloring to realize that. But it, is it all yours? He tugged gently at her long hair. I mean... Are you wearing a fall? A what? A fall. A, a false piece under it, under to give it that thickness. Why should I? He smiled suddenly. It was a smile completely out of context with his bold questions. A humble smile because most girls need one to get that kind of a look. He shook his head sadly. That's the big trouble in finding the right girl. Either they have good hair and lousy teeth or good hair and teeth and a bad nose. I suppose you're pretty well looked. I mean, you wouldn't consider working for us on an exclusive basis. As what? Anne looked 
toward Jennifer for assistance, but she was busy whispering some French endearment to Claude. Well, you see, with television coming in, I figure radio will be finished in another year. As far as the big shows are concerned, I want Jillian want a Jillian girl. I want to feature that girl in all my ads, hair, nail polish, lipstick, the works. I've seen several girls I like. He reeled off the names of five of the top models, but they make too much money to work for me exclusively. I don't want the Jillian girl posing for Ted Casablanca's clothes in Vogue or for Chanel's perfume in Harper's. I want her to be identified with Jillian products only. And all I can pay to start with is 300 a week. Anne sipped her champagne. She didn't know what to say. He took her silence for a refusal. I'll give you a year's contract with an option for 500 the second six months and extra money if we use you when we go on television. Jennifer suddenly came to life. Did I hear money? She asked. I'm telling your friend I'd like to make her the Jillian girl. Jennifer's eyes widened, but of course Anne would be perfect. She sure would. She's beautiful, not too sexy, the all-American girl, Kevin said. Claude threw up his hands. There is that word again, you Americans. You don't know what to do with a beautiful girl. You keep trying to make everyone look like the girl next door. If that is what the public want, no one would go to the movies. Take Jennifer. She will be the big hit because she is not the girl next door. She is the girl every man dreams of having. I agree, but it doesn't work that way in advertising, Kevin insisted. Uh, we use sex, but in a subtle kind of way. Anne is beautiful, but she has that type of beauty women can identify with. A college girl or a young matron will think she can look like Anne if she uses our product, but she never, but she would never think she could look like Jennifer. You're selling escapism in pictures. I'm selling a product. Anne is right. For my product, people won't stop to think that it's her fine bone structure that does it or the way her eyes are spaced or the thickness of her own lashes. They'll think if they use the same product, it will happen to them. Her kind of beauty doesn't frighten them. Jennifer's would. Well, I'm taking my frightened beauty to Paris, Jennifer said. But Anne, I think you should take Kevin's offer. You need a change. We all need one. Anne frowned. I'm not a model, and I'm, I am very happy working for... Jennifer nudged her and stood up. I think it's time to pat her on noses. Come on, Anne. As she followed Anne out of the room, she turned and tossed Kevin a, a, a reassuring wink. He nodded and helped and held up crossed fingers. They sat in front of a large mirror while the attendant stood by, carefully acting bored and disinterested. All right, Jennifer began her attack instantly. Why not? I don't know nothing about modeling. I know nothing about movies, but that's not stopping me and in, Par and in Paris yet. You'll be wonderful. Don't change the subject. What are you making uh, making with Henry? A hundred and fifty a week now. But that's not important. I just sold the house and got a wonderful price, and Henry invested that in. My stock's gone way up. Money is the last thing I need. But this will be exciting. I can't leave Henry. Henry? Jennifer's eyes were accusing. And you're talking to me, Jen. You mean you can't leave that office because it's still a link to Leon Burke? But he won't come back to you. Stop dreaming that someday he'll stride in and whisk you off. That's over. Finished. He, how do you know? I mean, next week his book comes out. Well, we'll have to be here for it. Most authors do. Most, most authors do, don't they? Jennifer studied her bag. She played idly with the handle. Anne, I wasn't going to tell you, but now I think you should know. He's gone back to England. Back? Her mouth felt dry. She was afraid she was going to be sick. You mean he was here? Jennifer's nod was solemn. For a week, you see, his publisher did a complete rewrite throughout practically everything he had written here, then went back to there and wrote some from scratch. That's why it's taken so long, but it's a good book, Henry told me. He saw Leon. Henry saw him? They met for lunch. Leon was already started his second book. He's got a fairly good advance from his publisher, and he went back to London 
He's taking a flight there. He saw Henry. He was here. She stopped. The tears ran down her face. Jennifer threw her arms around her. Anne, don't take it that way. Henry said Leanne thinks about nothing but his writing. It's the only thing that matters to him now. But Henry knows how I feel. Why didn't he tell me Leanne was here? Because he's a man, and men stick together, Anne. And you owe Henry nothing, and you need a change. This is fate. Claude didn't invite Kevin Gilmore today. He just wanted... He just wandered in alone and joined us. I think it's meant to be. Maybe you're right, Anne said slowly. I've got to get out of the office. It's like a living shrine. Now you're making sense. And unload that apartment, too. Now fix your face. Don't lose the job before you get it. At first, Henry was upset, but he grudgingly admitted that Gillian's offer was excellent. This is your doing, he said to Jennifer, who had come with Anne to break the news. You know it's best for her, Jennifer, said Marilee. Now come on, Henry, how long did you expect to keep Anne chained here? She isn't Miss Stainberg, you know. Okay, but bring the contract to me before you sign it, he grumbled. Let's see if we get some, get, get some extras in the deal. Let's, uh, television is coming in strong. I don't want anything left for later negotiation if he wants you for his ads. He has to guarantee to use you on the commercials. But Henry, Ann protested, I'd faint in front of a television camera. It'll be no different from a photographer's camera, and you'll have had about a year's experience by then. Incidentally, he scribbled the name on a pad. Start seeing Lil Cole. Take at least two private lessons a week. It's expensive, but you can afford it. Who's Lil Cole, Anne asked. The best speech and diction coach there is. What do I need her for? Because I have a hunch the commercials will wind up being more than just posing. You've got to get rid of that Boston accent. Henry, I'm just going to model, not be an actress. Listen, Anne, his voice was stern. If you're going to do something, do it 100%. There's no halfway business about any job. You were a great secretary. Now, if you're going to be the Jillian girl, be the best there is. Besides, what else have you got to do? Maybe keep busy and the best thing is the best thing for you right now. He suddenly looked very tired, as if all the strength had drained out of him. Impulsively, Anne threw her arms around him. Henry, I love you. He scowled to cover his emotions. How do you like that, he said to Jennifer. I've had a giant crush on this girl for two years, and now that she's walking out on me, she tells me she loves me. I do, Henry, and I always shall, and please, always be my friend. Just try and lose me. You're one in a million, Anne. They don't come like you. Now scram. I gotta call the agencies. Who knows, maybe another Anne Wells might walk, walk in. Do you want me to stay until you find someone I can help break her in? No, beat it, Jennifer. Jennifer's only going to be here a short time. You two girls lit it up. Incidentally, Jennifer, your alimony comes to 700 after taxes. Knowing you, I'll take the taxes out right away. This picture deal will complicate things. Do you want your, che your checks sent to you? No, keep my money here. Invest it. Make me rich like Anne. He, he laughed. Two Rockefellers I got here. Whoever said it was a man's world. I'm getting mine the hard way, Jennifer said grimly. Sure, you had to sweat out five months at a swimming pool real tough. Jennifer flashed her brightest smile. Yes, it was all just fun and games. Listen, all I ask is the next life is to come back as a beautiful broad, Henry insisted. And now you got pairs ahead. You'll wind up as the French Lana Turner, but do me a favor. Don't spend all your money. You owe me two thousand. I'm deducting it from your alimony, and for Christ's sake, don't send it. Send for it. Give me a chance to save some of it for you. Clients like you, like the two of you, I sure need. Which reminds me, Jennifer said sweetly, advance me another thousand, Henry. I need clothes after all. I gotta make a big entrance in Paris. February nineteen forty eight. Anne rushed into 21 and joined Henry at his usual front table. Sorry I'm late. Lil Cole is a slave driver. She sat down. Henry noticed that every man in the room had turned to look at her. Three weeks of grooming with Kevin Gilmore's makeup experts had created an indefinable yet eye-catching change. 
they hadn't tampered with her natural beauty, yet somehow they succeeded in heightening it. Before it used to creep up on you, now you noticed it immediately. She wore eye makeup and her hair was fuller like a lion's mane. She looked every inch the lady, but she was exciting now. I got a long letter from Jennifer this morning. She said unaware of the stir she had created. I got a short one asking for money, Anne. How fast can she spend it? Anne laughed and ordered a salad. No matter how much she has, she'll always be in debt. Jennifer is a compulsive spender. I don't know why. It's not as if she enjoys the things she buys. She gives most of them away. Henry shook his head. I hope she finds a guy, a good guy over here. I don't think she's much of an actress, but she has one hell of a face and a body. I hope she makes it pay off because that's all she's got. And when that goes, that'll be the end of Jennifer. Henry, I gave you more credit. All you like all the, uh, are you like all the others taking Jennifer at face value? She's a wonderful girl, but no man ever takes the trouble to find out. I thought you were different. Jennifer is really a fine person, a real friend and sweet. She's one of the sweetest girls I've ever known. Sweet. Okay. I'll go along with that. Sweet on the surface. That smile is glued on you, but tell me something, Anne. How deep do her feelings go? That's hard to say. Jennifer doesn't open up too much. You know something, I've never really heard her pan anyone. She is sweet about everyone. I know that is a funny word to use about Jennifer, but it's the right word for her. I've lived with her, I know. Now, Neely is someone you think of as sweet, but she isn't Neely sharp and bright. But she isn't sweet, Jennifer. Jennifer is. Do you know she never says anything against the prince? Just that it didn't work out. No vindictiveness against him. Or Tony. Or even Miriam. Just says she couldn't take the boredom of California. No, she's basically lonely underneath all that glamour. Waiting for a man who'll take her for herself. Because Jennifer really wants just one man and a normal life and children. So how come she got rid of her baby? That's when she lost me. She called me from the coast hysterical because they wanted her to get rid of it. At least the sister did. She wanted to keep it then after I knocked my brains out getting her a good alimony. She unloads it. You tell me a dame who wants a kid just can't live on a thousand a week? She never talked about it or gave any reason, Anne said slowly, but somewhere along the line she must have lost her nerve about raising it all alone. I'm sure if she ever found the right man, she'd settle down. Henry looked at her closely. And what about you? Oh, things are going fine. We finished all the test shots. I posed for Jillian first spring layout next week. I don't mean that, Anne. I mean your future. You know being the Jillian girl is going to change things. Once your face getting plastered in magazines and on billboards, a lot of excitement is going to come your way. I've been through that, she reminded, she reminded him. Remember me just two years ago? I was on the front pages and all the columns. Alan Cooper, Cinderella girl. But it didn't change me, Henry said quietly. It did change you. You didn't ma marry Leon Burke, did you? She studied her plate. I want to, Henry, more than anything in the world. I still want to. Why didn't you when you had the chance? He wanted me to live in Lawrenceville. That's what I mean, he said slowly. The girl who walked into my office that first day would have gone to the ends of the earth for the man she loved. That's why I took you. I figured you'd be pretty hard to please. You wouldn't fall for just any guy. I had counted on Leon coming back the minute he walked in. I said, goodbye, Anne. This is it. Unfortunately, Leon was never ca capable of really caring for anyone deeply, man or woman. You and me were alike. When we care for someone, we make gods of them. Leon loved me. I know he did, she said stubbornly, but not as much as he loved himself. A man who could cut every tie the way Leon does is a man who could never care deeply. Leon is like Jennifer in a way. They fall in love, the Leons and the Jennifers, but they can walk away unscarred because number one always comes first. Remember it, Anne. You're young. Keep those eyes wide, and when you meet another guy who's for real, grab him and run for the hills. Don't hang around the glamour belt too long. 
I don't think there will be anyone else who really matters, she said. Leon was it. Leon's gone, he said roughly, over, done, I understand, but it still doesn't change me. I can't just fall for the first passable man who comes along I want to marry one day, and have children, but I want a man I love, she sighed, and I'll never love anyone like I did Leon. Listen, he said, don't be a schmuck like me. I love too, only one day my whole life, Helen Lawson. And I knew well, goddamn well, right from the start, that she didn't love me. She wasn't capable of loving anyone. I taught her everything, and smart as I was, I never stopped loving her. Maybe I never gave myself a chance to find a real girl. So how do I wind up alone? Maybe you and Helen could still... Are you kidding? But you said you loved her. I did. I loved what I pretended she was what I wanted her to be, but now I see her as she really is, and I'm too old to find someone else. It's catching up with her, though. She's beginning to look on the outside like she is inside, old iron sides. I'd kill anyone who called her that to my face, but I can say it to you. I'm not really in love with Helen anymore, but I can't break the habit. It sneaks up on you, and the habit, and... After all, emotion is going and logic takes over. The habit is still there for the rest of your life. So don't you, at 22, start building any habit. Leon isn't wasting a moment thinking about you, believe me. And you stop thinking about him, Anne smiled weakly. I'll try. I can only try. Wow. That's it. We're going to stop right there for now. Maybe I'll come back later. We'll see how the day goes um, and that construction across the hall. But that we are reading Valley of the Dolls. We are up to page 284 of 500 pages. This is just such a good book. Oh, my goodness. And we will get to that later. And here is my product placement is my toothbrush, my Colgate 360. I've been using these kind of toothbrushes for a while. They are just right. But I've noticed that when you find a toothbrush you love, they for some reason discontinue it and then you're stuck. You have to find another one. And you have to go through so many different toothbrushes before you find the one that works. But this one's worked for me and I hope they don't discontinue it. Hi, how are you? Let me see who you are. Hi, Tinker. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you for tuning in. And this is my product placement is Wet n Wild Mascara that I buy at the Dollar Tree for $1.25. But the dollar store around the corner for me is going out of business. That's the end of the cheap China crap. So maybe they'll put a five below in, which is more cheap China crap. But anyway, it's a funner store, the dollar store. The Dollar Tree got kind of run down. I don't know. Anyway, that's that. And I hope you have a wonderful day. We're having another winter storm. I love the winter weather. I, I can't get enough of it. But let me know you were here so I can go back and look at your channel. And I hope you have a wonderful day. You are the best part of this world. And I'm so happy that we are part of it together. Big kiss. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Happy Friday.